about fine community in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 23 through 25. You can turn there real quick. While you're turning there, let me just make one balancing statement. Um, Because usually people who need to hear you don't hear you, and the people who don't need to hear you are the ones that hear you. I'm not talking today to people who are um, incapable of traveling. I'm not talking to people who... Uh, maybe are elderly or sick or shut in or any of that. Neither am I uh, talking about summer vacations or any of that kind of stuff. Listen, I understand. I've been here now. This is my 14th summer. Uh, Believe it or not, my 14th summer. I understand summer in Michigan, okay? And to be honest with you, I'm looking around going, dear Lord, it's a good thing we're going to two services in September because when everybody gets off vacation, we're going to have major trouble. I mean, look at the crowd today. This is, this is the first week in July, you know, when all of the automobile industry shut down and everybody's gone. Um, I'm not talking about that. I want you to go have your summer time. I want you to go have your family time, all of that kind of stuff. I'm not expecting you to be here every ser- service, the, any of that kind of stuff. So put all of that out of your head. But I do want to expose what I believe is a growing deception of the enemy, and that is a lack of value and importance for community. We have to have community. We were created for community. Can somebody say amen to that? And so don't even get locked into Sunday morning church service. Don't get locked into that, okay? Understand, understand that, that community is God's way, okay? In fact, I was just thinking as, as uh, Deidre was, was sharing uh, the testimony, it's, it, this is a testimony of community, of us joining with them in Nicaragua. And I love the way you guys put together that video and just included everybody. You went, you went. Didn't you like how they did that? It went like, we did this, and you, by the way, gave us a little money. It, wasn't it awesome, the spirit and the attitude that they had in that video? Um, but, but it's about community, and, and together we can do so much more. Amen? Amen? Hebrews chapter 10, verse 23. Look at it very quickly. Very familiar passage of Scripture, but again, don't let the familiarity rob you of the truth. Watch this. It says this. He said, let us hold unswervingly. I love that term. Let us hold on to it unswervingly to the hope that we profess. For he who promised is faithful. A promise is only as good as the one who gives it. Shock. And let me tell you something. He has never failed and he never will. He holds true. He watches over his word to perform it. Amen. And everything he said he will fulfill. So hang on to it because he is faithful. Amen. Uh, He goes on to say, and let us do this. Let's consider... Let's dream up ways that we can spur one another on to love and good deeds. I love that. Just think about ways. Just sit around and just think of ways that you can kind of spur one another on to love good works, uh, good deeds. You know? and, and we all know what it means to spur. I mean, if you have a brother or sister that you grew up with, you knew what a spur was. <laughs> Hello, right? We know how to aggravate or agitate or push. But we need to do it to love one another and, and to good deeds. Let us also, he says, not give up on meeting together as so many are in the, say it, habit. That's the key word. I don't expect you. Listen, in my first church that I served at for eight and a half years, I never missed one day of work for eight and a half years. And I never missed a Sunday in eight and a half years. And it was because the mentality of that church was, you can go on vacation as long as you are home by Sunday. It was that strict. I don't expect that. Don't even want to look at you every week, okay? I'm, I'm, <laughs> so, but it, you know what? What's ha- what? What can easily happen and what is happening more and more across this nation is this, it's becoming a habit. And when it becomes a habit, you're, you're on a slippery slope. And I know I'm kind of preaching to the choir, but I'm going to give you some, I'm going to give you some things to hang on to today so that whenever you're ministering to other people who no longer think it's important to be a part of the local church, you've got something to share with them. 
Okay? And, and, and also so that you don't fall into that trap. Okay? But, but it says, let's not give up as some are in the habit, but let instead, but let us encourage one another. Haven't you already been encouraged today? I'm like, dear God, let's take an offering from missions right now. <laughs> Uh, let us encourage one another and all the more as you see the and by the way I didn't capitalize the D okay I'm going to tell you right now I don't care what a lot of, of modern preachers are saying there is a day coming it's called the return of Jesus Christ there is a day coming come on now I didn't make that up that's in the scripture and there is a day, capital D, coming, okay? It's approaching. And the closer that we get to it, and by the way, next week will be closer than this week if it doesn't happen this week. And we're, going to be, we're always getting closer, and the closer we get to it, the more important it is for us to gather together. No wonder there's such a deception that it's not that important. Doesn't it make sense that if God says it's important, the enemy's going to make it just the opposite? Why? Because there's going to be a great falling away. There's going to be a great deception that comes. And we need to understand the importance of gathering together. So let me just start by sharing with you a joke. I'm sure it was just a joke. I'm sure it was just a joke because one Sunday morning, a wife went in to wake up her husband to tell him to get ready for church. And he informed her, I'm not going. She goes, what do you mean you're not going? He goes, I have two good reasons why not to go. He says, the people don't like me, and I don't like them. <laughs> she said, well, sweetheart, I got good two good reasons for you to go. One, you're 54 years old. And number two, you're the pastor. <laughs> I'm going to make it real clear. I'm not 54. It was not my wife and me, okay? I like you. I like you. I like you. Okay. But, but, but see, listen, and, um, my, my family and I, we did something for the very first time recently uh, for 4th of July. We went glamping. Here's some pictures of us glamping. By the way, glamping is a word. It's, called, it's uh, glamorized camping, okay? I love camping. I love the real McCoy. But if I could get my wife and my daughter in a log cabin, I have done a good job. And... Uh, we, uh, we went for the very first time glamping uh, over in Davison. Uh, we actually went Friday through Wednesday. Uh, I just drove back to be with you last Sunday because it's important for us to be together. And, um, uh, <laughs> but uh, we, can I tell you, that is a different world. How many of you are into camping? You go to these campsites with your RVs and all that kind of, let me see your hands. That, is that not a different world? That is a complete, I, my eyes were open to a whole universe. I had no clue. Friend, I drive from my 12 acres when I, where I never see anybody to, to camp with 800 other campers on 10 acres. I'm like, what? I thought I was getting away. I'm closer and to see more people here than I've ever seen in my life. But they love it. We're going to go. We're going to get away and park our camper right next to another camper. And like, dear Lord. But it is a different world altogether. And it was funny because um, I was just so grateful that we had a good time for the most part. Uh, <laughs> Got to be honest, there were some moments. But anyway, um, uh, but my wife and I, you know, several times we were walking around and, and so forth. And it was funny because I, I thought about it afterwards. We walked up to people we never saw before in their life, our life. I mean, we walked up to people because we're trying to learn about this whole new lifestyle, you know. And, and so we would see something unique that somebody did. And we'd go up and then we'd start asking them questions, how they did it and where they get this, that, and the other. And, um, and you know, so, but I was thinking these same people... When everybody that we walked up to, they, they were so open and so excited to talk to us and want to know about us, blah, 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 blah. Why? Because they were in a camper on a campground, okay? But if they were in their home and I walked up to that same person in their house and knocked on their front door, they would have opened the door like, what are you doing here? I don't want to talk to you. What are 
But because of the change of the environment, there was a total different attitude toward welcoming me as a perfect stranger. Isn't that crazy? And can I tell you, should that not be the church? And, and I told my wife, I said, in all honesty, this is not my cup of tea because I, I would rather be, you know, in the woods where I don't see anything but creatures, you know, not people. And, and, and I like the roughing it type thing. But I said, I can see why people love this. Because there was community. And there was also, listen, and I even, I even pointed out to my kids. I said, listen, because all of them were there, my grandbabies were there, and, um, and, and so we're sitting around the fire, and, uh, and, and we were kind of laughing about the whole scenario. I have a fire pit in my backyard. We could do this in my backyard. I said to them, I said, but if it was my backyard, you wouldn't be here. You might block out an hour for me, and then you would be gone back to your house. But because we had to go somewhere, we're going to sit around the fire. And this was interesting to me because there were moments where we didn't have anything to say. But we didn't have anywhere to go. So we, so we stayed around the fire, just changing our positions of the seat as the wind changed directions. Been there, done that. You know, we're all changing positions. And because we were kind of stuck, all of a sudden, we begin to have conversations that would have never happened. Would have never happened if we weren't stuck in that moment of community. Amen? And can I tell you, we were created for community, church. Even those of us who are introverts by nature, we were created for community. Somebody say amen. amen. See, so, so can I just remind you that at the very beginning in Genesis chapter 2, and if you've been around here very long, verse 18, this is before sin even entered the world. Before sin even entered the world, God looked down at Adam and he said, this is not good. I've always associated not good with sin. No, this is not even a sin issue. This is not good for a man to be alone. And listen, I'm, I'm talking to some of you, maybe even by podcast today or by live stream. I'm telling you, it's not good for you to be isolated. It's just not good. It's not good for man to be alone, and I'm going to make a helpmate. Now, listen, listen, and every, every woman in here knows a man needs help, okay? And I understand, I understand, but it's more than just marriage. We need one another, amen? And can I also point out to you that the very first punishment that was delivered in Scripture was a punishment of breaking fellowship and throwing him in isolation. It was when Cain killed Abel, and the punishment was this. The Lord said, I'm going to make you a homeless wanderer. And he cried out, God, I can't handle this. This is way too heavy. This was a punishment, and yet we allow the enemy to deceive us. I don't need to be a part of the local church. I don't need to be a part of the organized religion. Listen, I know that the local church has this, its problems. But can I tell you something? That is God's plan, and it's a wonderful plan. Hello. I mean, come on, look at your own stinking biological family. I mean, many of us are going, how did I come out of this? <laughs> right? I mean, I mean, seriously. And, and uh, we, we need to recognize the importance of gathering together. And can I also point out to you that I never really thought about this until recently, but with every convenience, there is also a downside to it. We're all about convenience. But I mean, even go all the way back. I mean, every think, every convenient, I propose to you that every convenient of, you know, like modern convenient thing that man has created, there is a negative effect as well. And I'm not against convenience. I'm just saying, let's recognize it's there so that we can counteract it. You realize cars created a problem. 
Cars created a problem. It's a wonderful thing. I'm not saying get rid of your car. But you understand that cars created a problem. If nothing else, it's weight gain. Right? You go to countries where they don't have cars, you don't see a bunch of heavy people. Why? Because they walk it off. Phones. Now listen, I'm old enough, I remember party lines. Remember party lines? Young people, let me tell you what a party line is. A party line is you share the phone line with neighbors, two or three other neighbors. You pick up the phone to use it and there's already somebody talking. And you're like, oh, excuse me. I mean, I, friend, I remember party lines. I remember when phones used to be stuck on the wall. And so what you did was you got really long cords so that you could then go into the other room and have a quiet conversation, right? But with the convenience of phones that was designed to enhance communication, it actually could have a negative effect, especially with modern cell phones. Right, where you actually have people sitting in restaurants away from each other, texting their friend. <laughs> they made time to be with their wife or their husband or whatever, and they're over there and they're, they, uh, I'm like, it's designed to enhance communication, but it actually can break down communication. Even medicine. Have you looked at the side effects of medicine lately? Hello, and I thank God for medicine. I thank God for the modern conveniences. TV. Television, again, has broken down much of our communication, okay? When I'm, when I'm at home and my wife comes home, friend, I got to turn off the TV or we're just not going to have communication, okay? It, it, the, the, all of the conveniences, everything, washers and dryers. You realize before you had washers and dryers, all the ladies who'd be down at the river... I don't remember these days, I don't think you do either, but we know that they were there and they are still in some areas and you see community where they're scrubbing and they're talking and blah, 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 blah. Every convenience that you can think of has a counterproductive. Internet, oh dear Lord. Hello. Internet. We don't even know how to meditate anymore because we're just constantly taking in all this information and all this, all this. Cre and I'm not, I'm not against convenience. But what I am saying is let's stop for a moment and evaluate. Thank God for this convenience. But what is the give up for this convenience? And can I tell you, I see it more and more and more. And that is the give up many times is community. It's genuine relationship. So, oh dear Lord. Okay, I'm going to be very fast. Okay, number one is this. Community, we find strength in community. We find strength, we find encouragement in community. I find it interesting, Deuteronomy 32, 30, we love to quote it. It says, one can chase, how? How? Say how. How could one chase a thousand to flight? Have you ever thought about that? How could that happen? How? Because of our God. He says it. How could one chase a thousand flight? And by the way, two can chase 10,000. Not 2,000, but 10,000. How? Because of the Lord. Unless the Lord. And the Lord can give us favor. Okay? But, but there's strength. There's encouragement. And, and the scripture that I read at the beginning, Hebrews, says to encourage. To encourage means to give courage. To give courage, encourage one another, give courage, give strength to one another, and to provoke one another unto love and good works. It's a proven fact that, that if you have a draft horse, that's a horse that pulls weights, and if you have two horses that have been trained to work together, and each one of them could, could drag 8,000 pounds by itself, if, if they are trained and they work with another horse that can drag 8,000 pounds, they, they're not capable of just dragging 16,000, which would be double. Those two horses actually can drag 24,000 pounds. 
By themselves, eight, but together, not 16, but 24,000 pounds. And we can accomplish a whole lot more together at Nicaragua than we could ever do by ourselves. Amen? There's an exponential blessing when the people of God come together. Secondly, there's protection in community. I mean, every one of us, you know, I used to love to watch Wild Wild, Wild Kingdom on Sunday night. Remember o Omaha Wild Kingdom or whatever it is? Remember that? Man, that was a great show. I don't know what happened to it. But you know, we would all watch this lion attack some kind of herd, you know, whether it's zebras or whatever. And what they would do is they would scatter the herd... And then they would pick out the weak or the young one or the old one. They would scatter and then, and can I tell you something? The enemy is a master at dividing and conquering. And I know that you may love Jesus. You're at home. You love Jesus. You're committed to Jesus. And you see all the crud in my life and all of the crud in our life. But I'm telling you, we need you and you need us. When there is a there is a deception of where the enemy will get you aside. And listen, not only to protect from the enemy, but to, but to protect you from yourself. Hello, every one of us, myself included, needs protection from myself. There have been times, and I'm so grateful for you, there have been times where God has used individuals in this room to come and to protect me from myself. You've come and said, Pastor, I want to, I want to, I want to ask you to think about this. And because they respectfully and lovingly cared about me and said, Pastor, you, I want you to think about this. I, I, I did it and I realized that I was about to do something really stupid or that I was behaving in a way that was inappropriate. All of us need accountability. All of us need godly counsel. All of us, myself included, every one of us, we're, we're, we're sheep, we're dumb, we need help. And, and we need to protect one another. Can I remind you, Ecclesiastes said it this way. He said, listen, two are better than one. Because they get a good return, say good return, on their work. If one falls down, his friend can help him up. But pity the man who falls and has no one to help him up. Also, if two lie down together, they keep warm. But how can one keep warm alone? Though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves. And a cord of three strands is not quickly broken. Number three, real quick. Instruction is found in community. When you get together in community, you learn from one another. And, and, and can I tell you something? If you want to learn, you can learn from each and every person that's involved in your life. But, but, but Paul, writing to his spiritual son, Timothy, who was a pastor, well, notice what his advice to him was. You must, this is not an option, you must teach. You must teach what is in accord with sound doctrine. And watch this. Teach older men to be temperate, worthy of respect, to be self-controlled and sound in faith, in love and in endurance. Likewise, I want you to teach older women to be reverent in their way of their life they live, not to be slanderous or addicted to much wine, but to teach what is good. And by the way, that way they can then teach or train the younger women to love their husbands and their children, to be self-controlled and pure, to be busy at home and to be kind and be subject to their husbands so that no one will malign the word of God. And by the way, similarly, I want you to encourage and teach young men to be self-controlled. You know what was common? in all of these self-control did you catch that self-control in all of them we got to teach one another self-control and everything to set them an example of doing what is good in your teaching show integrity and seriousness and soundness of speech that cannot be condemned so that those who oppose you may be ashamed because they have nothing bad to say about us one of my favorite stories um, that I came across years ago was in the 1980s, um, some hunters made a drastic mistake in some parts of Africa, and, uh, and not only in Africa, but different parts of the world, where they went and they, they killed the most mature elephant bulls for trophies. 
They took out all the mature elephant bulls and it caused major trouble. Because all the juvenile bulls started going wild. They, 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 they didn't know how to use their strength. They didn't know what the purpose of their strength was. In fact, they were killing off rhinos. And they, they were trying to figure out why in the world are all these elephants just going crazy? And then they, it finally dawned on one of them that there was no bigger, maturer bulls to keep the younger bulls in line and to teach them what it was like or what the purpose and the function of being a bull was. And can I tell you, every one of us need mamas and daddies to speak to us, to teach us what we're supposed to be. And so what they ended up doing was they actually transported. It was very, very difficult to do. But they transported some mature bulls to this area where all of these juvenile bulls were at killing rhinos. And within days, Papa Bull put them all in line and brought peace and harmony to the place. We all, listen, we all need one another. We receive instruction. Can you say amen? amen. Number four is maturity happens in community. Can I tell you something? You don't need your Christianity when you're alone. It's when you're with people that you need Christianity. <laughs> Hello! <laughs> and can I remind you that iron sharpens iron? And as iron rubs up against iron, so one man sharpens another. Listen, I was created to irritate you. <laughs> and you are doing a great job at irritating me. No. <laughs> That's what we were created for. We were created to expose those areas in our life that need a little rubbing off, that need a little sharpening. Hello. We're that, and, and, but can I tell you something? In order to sharpen, you have to have friction. And you know what friction causes, don't you? Heat. That's why when you get in church, you're going to have heated moments. When you, get in, when you get in life groups, you're going to have those heated moments. When you get in a marriage, you're going to have some heated moments. But recognize it's good for you. It sharpens you. It, it takes off the edge. It, it, it removes those things that don't look like Jesus. That's the reason for community. And we sharpen one another. We, we work on one another. Hello. <laughs> I'm glad you liked that point, Lila. By the way, you are... No, no. <laughs> number five, number five, is love and acceptance is found in community. Uh, again, you know, I was, I was astonished. We walked up, if we walked up to one camper, we walked up to a half a dozen campers. And every one of them were so excited that we stopped and talked to them. I mean, I was like, hey, I can get into this, man. This is better than church. I mean, if there's ever a place where there ought to be people ought to come, regardless of how they smell, how they talk, how they look, it ought to be church where they can come and be loved and accepted. Somebody say that. Hello. See, uh, but, but, but what a man really desires is unfailing love. Unconditional, unfailing love. Acceptance by by a church family. Jesus said it this way. He said, listen, they're going to know that you're my disciples. Not by your works, not by your deeds, but by your love. And can I say it again? Bill Johnson said it years ago. Disciples belonged before they believed. People need to feel like that they can come here and belong, whether they agree that, you know, in speaking in tongues or not, whether they agree in the gifts of the Spirit, whether they agree that Jesus Christ is Lord or not, it does not matter. They should feel welcomed here. Amen? I'm trying to move quick. I'm almost through. Six, care is found in community. Care is found in community. I find it interesting that when Jesus said to his, his, his disciple Peter, he said, he said, when he's restoring him, he said, do you love me? He said, yes. He said, then this is what I want you to do. I want you to take care of the sheep. Isn't that interesting? 
We need to care for one another. We need, to, we need to always be looking for ways to take care of one another. I find interesting in Matthew chapter 25 when Jesus is, is talking about separating the sheep from the goat and he put the sheep on the right hand side and he said this, he said, listen, uh, whenever I was hungry, you gave me something to eat. When, when, uh, whenever I was thirsty, you gave me something to drink. When I was a stranger, you took me in. When I needed clothes, you clothed me. Whenever I was sick, you looked after me. When I was in prison, you came and visited me. In other words, you cared for me. And they said, when when, when did we do that, Lord? And he said, listen, when you did it to one of the least, you did it to me. When you did it to the old widow in Nicaragua, you did it to me. And and, and can I tell you something? We will fail you. I promise you that. I'm going to tell you right now, I will fail you. We will fail you. Don't be so hard on me because you fail yourself sometimes. Right? Right? And, 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 and the Lord will want to, I mean, not the Lord, the, the enemy will want to bring offenses when we fail to take care of you, maybe the way that you felt like you ought to be taken care of and, and, and all that. And we always want to improve. We always want to do better. Here's what I've noticed, though. Most of the times, the ones that are really good at caring for other people are always well taken care of. Have you ever noticed that? But... But even if you are one of those who's really good at caring for other people, there are going to be times when you get let down. And whenever that happens, here's here's my posture that I take on any time that I get disappointed with what's happening. I evaluate and go, why am I frustrated right now? So that I can make sure that I hopefully won't do that to somebody else. So instead of taking an offense, I learn from it so that hopefully I don't put somebody else in that position. But shouldn't we take care of one another? By the way, Pastor, it's great to see you. God bless you. Um, But we should take care of one another. And number seven is, as, as the worship team comes, the new man is found in community. Whenever uh, I was in Israel, I, I saw this symbol that, in all honesty, I'd seen it but never had it explained to me before. And um, this is the symbol of the new man. If you'll notice, at the top is the menorah with a base, okay, the the triangle base of the menorah. And at the bottom is a fish with its tail, and the base and the tail make the Star of David. This was actually the first symbol for Christianity, not the fish. This was where Jesus was wanting to bring together the Jew and the Gentile to make the one new man. Isn't that awesome? In fact, in Ephesians, this is what he said. He said, uh, for he himself is our peace, who has made the two, the Jew and the Gentile, one, and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility, by abolishing in his flesh the law which is commanding uh, with its commandments and regulations. And his purpose was to create in him one new man out of the two, thus making peace, and in this one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross by which he put to death their hostility. It's the one new man. And can I, can I put it this way too? That... that Community is where we actually see the modern day Jesus, the body of Christ. Paul said it this way in 1 Corinthians 12. He said, you, you, you and you and you and you and you and you and me and you and you and you, you. We make up the body of Christ. Each one of us are a part of it. And we need to recognize, listen, I'm I'm just telling you right now, I'm not more important than you. I'm not more important than you. Just because I have the microphone most of the time doesn't mean I'm more important than you. One day I won't be here and this church will keep on. Unless the rapture takes place and I hope none of it's here. <laughs> but you understand? And, and, and those of you at home, you need to understand you are important. Now again, if you're, if you're sick or tired or you're on vacation and you're watching us, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about those of you who are habitually or who don't see the importance of it. I'm telling you, you are robbing us because you carry something we need. 
You might be the one that needs to deliver that word of encouragement. Or you might be the one that God wants to anoint to lay hands upon somebody and they get healed and they continue to walk in their sickness because you didn't understand the importance of gathering together. See, Paul said it this way in, earlier in that same book. He said this. He said, Now I plead with you, brothers, by the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing and that there be no division among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same job. Judgment. I'm so glad. I'm so glad that every day my finger decides to go with me. <laughs> I'm so glad that every day my foot wants to come with me. Whenever, if, if we had body parts that didn't show up one day, we would have issues. <laughs> and could you imagine trying to develop a championship football team when, when people decided that they would come to practice when they wanted to? It'd be hard. In fact, can I not only say it'd be hard, it'd be impossible. It's so important for us to, to make it a habit. Because I'm telling you right now, some of you are about to experience some miracles and some breakthroughs and some encouragement in the Lord. And it's not going to be because of anything I do. It's going to be because God's going to use you to give somebody else a word or lay hands upon somebody else and minister to them. Why? Because you decided to show up today and gather together. And God's going to use you right now to encourage somebody else in the Lord. So right now, stand with me all over this building. And I don't want you to race out the room because, again, you might be the word one. And you go, well, God's never used me. You know what? It could be today that God uses you. So right now, I want everybody to just close your eyes. Holy Spirit, I thank you for the body of Christ. And I thank you for this incredible church family. Father, I don't have a bone to pick today. I don't have an issue with anybody in this room. I don't have an issue with anybody at home today. I, I don't have issues. But I do want to expose a lie of the enemy today, and that is that the local church is not important. Because she's your bride. You died for her. And Father, right now, I just ask that you would use us right now as the body to minister to one another. Father, there's somebody here that needs a word of encouragement. There's somebody here that needs a prayer of faith. There's somebody here that needs a, a, the gift of healing to be manifested. There's, there's somebody here, or that they just need a confirmation right now of, of guidance and direction. And Holy Spirit, I ask that you would speak to us right now. Just ask the Holy Spirit to use you right now. Right now, just ask him. Spirit, we give you space. We give you time today. If you feel, if you feel led of the Holy Spirit to go pray with someone or encourage someone, I'm going to give you permission to do that in just a moment. Okay? Now, Ask them permission, first of all, to speak into their life. And then when someone speaks to you, you judge it. Don't just assume that they're right. You judge it. And the other thing I want to do is you're here today and you say, you would say to this church family, I really need someone to agree with me in prayer on something. I, I, I need either a miracle. I need healing. I need, I need Jesus in my life. I, you, you're just here and you need something. I want you right now just to raise your hand all over this building. And it, it, listen, a body of this size, there's going to be a bunch of us. So li lift your hand. This is your opportunity. This is your opportunity. Lift it up real high. Everybody open your eyes. Everybody open your eyes. And um, ask the Holy Spirit to lead you. If they want to share what that need is, let them share. If they don't, that's okay. Keep your hands up high. I want you to begin to move among us. Okay, just move among us. You can go to somebody with their hands lifted. If you felt like that God's got you a word of encouragement for somebody or uh, that you want to pray for somebody, I feel I just release you to do that. Okay? 
right now, just be, I want, I want you, I'm going to see movement. I want to see movement. I want to see acts of faith. Okay. Movement. Just move to somebody. If, if you don't have any, if, anything else, maybe move to somebody with their hands lifted. Can we just take a couple of minutes before you race out of here? Okay. And by the way, afterwards, I want to encourage you to go by our missionaries tables and pray with them and, and minister to them and, and talk to them just for a couple of minutes. But right now, and you know what? If you don't feel inclined, could you just right now just worship the Lord just for a moment? Can we do that? Create that spirit of worship right now all over this building. Could we just respectfully just hang just for a minute, okay? Just for a minute. I won't keep you long, but just respectfully hang and create an atmosphere right now. If it was you that really needed a, a need, had a need, you would want somebody to contend for you, even if it's just in the spirit of worship and prayer. So, come Samarike, Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, I ask that you would flow right now through the parts of the body. Father, I ask that you would activate, Lord, prophetic words that you would activate the gift of faith, that you would activate the gift of healing. Father, we ask for the gifts of the Spirit to be fully functioning and operating this morning. As the body ministers to the body, I pray, God, that you would just supernaturally change our world. Change our world today, Jesus. Care for somebody enough right now just to contend in the spirit for them right now. Could you just contend for somebody right now? He, even right there where you are, just, just ask Holy Spirit. Father, I declare healing right now to be released in this place. If you're uncomfortable, that's okay. Just work through your discomfort. Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. Father, transform the way that we think about church gatherings. Lord, where they're not performances, they're not shows, but they're opportunities for the body to come together and to minister one to the other. Holy Spirit, I just come against the enemy that would lie to us about our and devalue the importance of us as individuals. Father, Lord, that we recognize just how valuable and important we are. Holy Spirit, I, I just I, I even bind any spirit of condemnation that would want to come upon people. Lord, I just rebuke that and I just ask on the revelation of gathering together in your name which has hit us as a church family. Just a couple of more minutes, church. Come on. Oh, what a beautiful picture. Father, I just declare, Lord, activation of every gift. Every gift in this church, Lord. I just declare an activation of the gifts of the Spirit, Lord, so that miracles could break out.